Once again, I'd like to welcome everyone to this month's Wildlife for Lunch webinar. Today's webinar is on conserving our Texas grasslands. It's presented by John Hayes. He's a conservation delivery specialist with Texas Parks and Wildlife Department and the Oaks and Prairies Joint Venture. Today's webinar is made possible through funding provided by the San Antonio Livestock Exposition Incorporated, and it's hosted by the Texas Wildlife Association and Texas A&M AgriLife Extension. With that, John, you should have controls. Sure. Can you hear me fine? Absolutely. Okay. Well, hi, everybody. Thanks for uh, tuning in today. I know this is a, a change of topic than what you might have expected, but hopefully we'll, uh, we'll pique your interest in, in other ways. So um, my name is John Hayes. I work for the uh, Texas Parks and Wildlife Department of the Oaks and Prairies Joint Venture, and, and uh, I spend most of my uh, waking hours thinking about uh, how to and, and where to conserve uh, grasslands in Texas. So I know that's not necessarily a topic that, that everybody's always familiar with, so I usually like to start by giving an idea of, of what it is we're talking about, what are our Texas grasslands and, and where do we find them. Uh, so one of the, the most common things that, that I tend to hear from, from landowners is uh, when we work with them, we're out on the land talking about uh, uh, places and, and properties. Uh, they always think of, we always think of uh, the landscape and, and sort of our use of it, how we define it. So uh, it's either, you know, that that uh, uh, that pasture where I've got the cows or uh, a, a hay meadow or, or you know, old cropland, uh, current cropland, or it's development, you know, it's highways, it's, it's cities, it's towns, it's growing suburbs. Uh, but one of the things that, that few realize, but, but hopefully more and more are beginning to, is that uh, most of this part of Texas, uh, basically everything west of the, the Piney Woods and, and east of the, you know, the deserts of, of far west Texas and south Texas, uh, was dominated by open grass prairie at one point. Uh, that prairie differs in, in size and shape and structure, uh, but for the most part, uh, the, the, central Tex the area of central Texas we're talking about was, was mostly all grasslands. The early European settlers, uh, the most famous Cabeza de Vaca, the first European to uh, to come through Texas described uh, riding for days on horseback and grass up to a horse's withers without a tree in sight. So you can imagine a, a sea of grass, grass blowing in the wind. However we define it now, this is basically all, all part of the, the Great Plains. And so uh, that Great Plains complex, we're kind of at the southern extent of, uh, but you guys all know we learned this in geography in junior high. It, basically the Great Plains go all the way from down here in the, the southern plains and in coastal prairie up to you know, Saskatchewan and Alberta and, and everywhere in between. Uh, like I said, those, those grasslands change. They're, they have different shape and size and structure depending on where you are, uh, but for the most part, they're dominated by uh, grass as opposed to woody vegetation, and they have enough rainfall uh, to, to not, be, not be considered technically a desert, but I'll, I'll address that in a minute as well. So why are these grasslands here? What, what causes them to be here? Well, once again, you learn this, and in junior high probably as well, but uh, this effect called the rain shadow causes this phenomenon, these grasslands to appear uh, all over the world. No matter what continent you're on, there's some sort of uh, example of this. But here, uh, when, when we have those, that dominant jet stream and, and trade winds blowing uh, uh, air off of the Pacific Ocean into uh, the western United States, that, that wet air carrying that moisture from the ocean is forced to rise over the Sierra Nevada and then the, the Rocky Mountains. When it does so, that air cools, causes the water in those clouds to condense, rains on the western slope. When those, uh, that air mass moves east, there's less moisture to, to carry eastward. And so what happens is you have this thing called a rain shadow, this dry area uh, that's just adjacent, just east of, uh, or on the downwind side of, of the mountains. So that's caused in the past this area to be described as a desert. Uh, the Great American Desert. Now, we're kind of, you can see from this map, this is showing rainfall patterns, and in, 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 as you move closer to the Gulf Coast, and as that uh, air mass starts to move east and, and pick up moisture from the, uh, uh, from, from the landscape, uh, you start to get a little more rain, and, and we're in sort of that, that transition zone uh, in, in the eastern part of Texas. But for the most part, this area is all mostly dry, uh, but not technically a desert because it still gets, uh, most of it gets more than 10 inches of rain a year. But people that, that 
first came to these areas, thought of them as pretty dismal. So John James Audubon here, we all know that name. Uh, the prairies around us are the most arid and dismal you can conceive of. In fact, these prairies look more like great deserts. That this section of the country should ever become inhabited by civilized man, except in the vicinity of large watercourses, is an idea too preposterous, too preposterous to be entertained for a single moment. Now we know that seven of the 15 fastest growing uh, cities in America are all on the I-35 corridor. So obviously this, some of this, these predictions weren't right. I did not hesitate in giving the opinion that it is almost wholly unfit for cultivation and of course uninhabitable by people depending on agriculture for their subsistence. Now we know that this is the breadbasket of the world and we uh, provide uh, food, fiber, and fuel for not just the U.S., but uh, uh, large populations of people all over the world. So this guy always knew that though, right? The buffalo found this area to be, uh, has, has been its home for for uh, uh, thousands of years. So uh, the, the uh, grass, although it can be incredibly productive, it's actually kind of a hard thing for uh, critters, including ourselves, to make a living off of, to get enough food off of. But buffalo, and we know cows, uh, uh, develop the, the digestive ability to be able to uh, uh, actually thrive on these grasslands. We know that is the ruminant gut. And so the, the prairies were shaped in a lot of ways by tens of thousands of these buffalo that ranged across uh, this part of the U.S. The other thing that kept these areas open uh, in, in, in grass was frequent fires. So we always kind of thought of this as something that was driven by lightning strike. These, these wildfires that would run across this area, they would find that dry grass that was left by the, the rain shadow uh, to be great fuel, and so the, the fires would just roar across the prairie um, pretty frequently. Most of the research now will tell you, though, that uh, uh, it's actually the Native Americans that a lot of the, that fire is attributed to. It wasn't necessarily lightning strikes. Uh, if you look at the frequency of lightning strikes that cause wildfire in tree rings, it seems to be some evidence would say that uh, uh, it, lightning strikes don't cause uh, enough occurrence of wildfires to explain the amount of wildfire we see on tree rings. So there must have been some other driver. Uh, Steve Pine, who's the kind of preeminent fire historian, uh, put it this way, and I won't read all this, but uh, uh, basically he said so extensive were the effects of Native Americans lighting the, uh, these fires is that uh, the world, the, the New World was replaced forested land with grassland or savanna, uh, or where forest persisted, it was opened up and freed from underbrush. And so uh, this is really one of these, one of the main drivers of keeping this area in open grass. Now we're talking about grass, what are we talking about? We're not talking about the same grass that's out in your, your lawn. Uh, we're talking about the, the big four, uh, big blue stem, switchgrass, yellow Indian grass, little blue stem. These are the, the four major grasses that make up the, the tall grass prairie. There's a lot of other different kinds, too many to show on a slide, but one other I throw in here is side oats grama. Uh, that's actually the uh, state grass of Texas. And uh, it's a little shorter stature grass, one of the earlier ones to come on after a disturbance. Uh, but it's a great grass if you can if you can find it out there. So why is it that we have these what are called native warm season grasses? Now this is a topic I could I, I couldn't have give a whole talk on in of itself. I can get a little technical, but just to give you an idea of uh, what it is about warm season grasses that that tend to work here is uh, uh, first off they've Somewhere in the past, evolutionarily, they developed uh, what was called C4 metabolism versus C3 metabolism. That has to do with some complicated uh, chemistry, but uh, uh, basically they adapted a metabolic process that uses less water. And so these, these grasses, these warm season grasses, are uh, uh, evolved to grow best under dry, arid conditions, or at least outcompete other species. Uh, they have a, a vertical growth pattern as opposed to a a horizontal growth pattern. So uh, where your turf grasses, your Bermuda grass, those kind of things grow kind of along on a, on a horizontal layer along the ground, these grasses grow up and down. Now what this allows these bunch grasses to do is grow, send roots very far down into the soil to be able to find water wherever it's available. Uh, remember these are arid areas and so there isn't abundant water in the topsoil uh, and so it needs that, that be able to grow vertically to really send those roots down to, to find that water. Uh, these grasses are perennial as opposed to annual, and so by having a perennial grass that doesn't need to grow from seed every year, uh, it can have years and years of growth that help it put those roots down. Uh, it also is able to store energy so it responds quickly after a, a disturbance like, say, a, a fire. 
and then those periodic disturbances prevented naturally uh, uh, woody plants from, from moving in. In natural ecosystem succession, if you take a patch of bare dirt uh, and you give it enough water, it's going to move from annual plants to perennial plants to shrubs to softwood trees and hardwood trees. Uh, uh, fire and disturbance in the grasslands prevents that from happening, and so it remains in, in native warm season grasses. So uh, these grasses can be pretty impressive. We talk about those that vertical structure and those roots. Uh, here's a good example. If anybody's uh, ever uh, uh, frequented the the Columbus area, uh, you might know this guy. Uh, Jim Willis is uh, the, the director of the Wildlife Habitat Federation, a great outfit that does native grass restoration out of the Cat Spring uh, area. But uh, this picture we took at that was Prairie Chicken Refuge, and this is a little blue stem plant that he actually grew out for a year in a PVC pipe filled with soil. That's just one year's growth. That shows from one seed the, the amount of uh, root structure that can grow. So you can imagine the, the benefit that has to, to the soil, to, to water infiltration, and the amount of water that that plant's able to find. And then when you think about that in a whole field, pasture or landscape, uh, one of those plants multiplied by uh, thousands, and you can imagine the sort of uh, you know, subsoil structure that is provided by that, that huge plant community. It's like an iceberg, you know, you're just seeing the tip of it, this huge growth that's going on under the soil, and there's, uh, you know, bacterial insect life that's, that's associated with that as well. So the, the benefits of that kind of uh, uh, plant life being out there, that plant community being out there, are, are numerous. Uh, there's huge benefits for water and soil. Uh, so warm season bunch grasses have a high tolerance to sediment loads. They remain effective filter strips for extended periods of time. So when that water runs off the land, uh, they can catch that, that, uh, uh, the, the topsoil that's, that's running off with it. Uh, so those warm season perennial bunch grasses slow water velocities due to greater hydraulic resistance. You can imagine if you have turf grass like Bermuda grass, the water just uses that sheet flow off of it. You got these tall grasses that are gonna uh, slow down that, uh, that velocity. It, it changes the, the hydrology. Uh, the associated root mass increases water infiltration. Imagine, you think about that, the, the roots I showed in that little blue stem, uh, those all being straws that stick down into the ground, allow water to, to run down into the soil, and so you have uh, you know, benefits to groundwater, aquifer recharge, and those type of things from, uh, from increased uh, uh, grass, pipe, grass communities. One thing I don't mention here is the difference between a, a grass community compared to a uh, shrubland community. Uh, you can imagine that uh, uh, trees through evapotranspiration can really lose a lot of water, especially uh, uh, evergreen ones like, like red cedar. So when you have uh, uh, grass, they have less of the, uh, that impact and they lose less of that, that soil to evapotranspiration throughout the, uh, throughout the cool season. So important benefits to soil and water of having these grasses out there. And then there's benefits to the, to the, uh, the earth and the atmosphere as well. Uh, carbon sequestration rates of bunch grasses exceed, exceed those of annual crops by up to 20 to 30 times. And so we're talking about a perennial grass that's going to maintain that root mass. It's not going to be harvested and, and plowed under every year. And so uh, uh, it's going to store much more carbon from year to year compared to, say, uh, you know, corn or something like that. Uh, native grasslands produce only 6% of the global biomass, but have 15% of the global soil organic carbon. So they're a carbon sink. They, they hold more than they, than they produce. Uh, more than 95% of the carbon in C4 grasses is below ground and soil organic carbon. So even if there's an above ground disturbance like fire, that, that root mass continues to hold that carbon. And then uh, native warm season grass roots are significantly more massive than those of introduced species. And carbon sequestration rates are reportedly greater. And then the benefits to, to wildlife is probably what uh, 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 most of us are interested in here today, what, what I spend most of my time thinking about. Uh, now we tend to think of a lot of these as the you know the, the Great Plains as the flyover states, right? Mostly just corn and wheat fields, uh, maybe some open rangeland, not much there. Uh, if you would have been here a couple hundred years ago, though, you'd see a different story. It was more like something out of a an African uh, you know safari documentary. Um, you know, some people even call this area the America's Serengeti. So you'd have huge herds of uh, these different you know ungulates, uh, not just the buffalo. But elk, we think of elk obviously in the, the Rocky Mountains and in the forest. They're basically there because that's the only place we've, we've let them stay. Uh, there used to be herds of, of plains elk out on the prairie. A pronghorn antelope, 
another one that we still see in some areas of, of some of the more short grass prairies, some of the more arid areas, they would have ranged over, over a much larger area uh, of Texas and of the, the Great Plains uh, a few hundred years ago. And then you've got birds like prairie chickens, all the prairie grouse, it's a whole family that includes sage grouse, lesser and greater prairie chicken, and all those. Um, those used to be in, in uh, huge colonies, and, and it can show a, a ton of different things here, whether it was uh, packs of, of wolves uh, ranging across the, the prairie to prairie dogs, burrowing owls, and all, all the, the different things. So it was something that was, was really diverse. It, it, it isn't an a, a empty uh, wasteland by any means. And then what, the thing that particularly interests me is the, the birds of these prairies. Uh, this is something that even birders tend to overlook. Uh, a lot of folks think of these as just little brown birds that uh, we don't bother to learn to identify. Uh, but there's actually some real, uh, uh, real pretty birds and some real beauty in here and uh, some pretty neat birds as well. Um, we'll go through a, a couple of these. Uh, but first off, I want to show, oh, ooh, that might not be working. Um, these, uh, let me see here. Hopefully that looks better. Uh, all, a lot of these bird species that occupy these grasslands are in serious decline. Uh, we know that about something like, say, the northern bobwhite. That's that black line there. Since 1965, this is based on breeding bird survey data that's been collected over the last 50 years. Uh, we've seen a, a pretty significant decline in those birds. But even something as common as the eastern meadowlark, which is the yellow line, um, uh, has shown a, a, a huge decline. They're still somewhat common, uh, still something we see uh, relatively frequently, but compared to their peaks, uh, we've lost a, a huge percentage. To show those numbers another way, uh, if we just look at the, uh, this is the percent decline in the last 50 years, basically since 1965 when these, when these uh, numbers started getting collected. So in, in uh, most of Central Texas, this basically is showing the numbers for uh, Central Texas and the Edwards Plateau. Uh, in most of this area, Northern Bob White declined by over 90%. Uh, like I said, eastern meadowlark, common bird, something we don't think of as, as declining, uh, uh, only a quarter of, of what used to be here. And then another one, common bird, scissor-tail flycatcher, the state bird of Oklahoma, uh, less than half of what used to be here uh, still exists. So even when you see right now, this time of year, they're all gathering up to, to move south. Uh, they'll, they'll pile up on the power lines, at least where I am in, in uh, uh, coastal Texas, and uh, they'll get ready to move south. There's less than half of what there used to be. Uh, loggerhead strikes a neat one I'll talk about in a minute, but those are a drastic decline, and even a lot of the sparrows are as well. So when you look at uh, uh, declining bird species at the landscape scale, this map is from the Partners in Flight uh, Land Bird Plan, which is a national plan for conservation of bird species. And, and what the PT score is that this is showing is the percentage of birds uh, in that landscape that are showing uh, significant decline. And so the higher the PT score, the darker the, the score, uh, the higher percentage of birds that are native to that area are declining. And so you see uh, by far the, the, the place where we've seen the most and most drastic decline has been in the, the Great Plains. It's an area that it doesn't receive a lot of attention in my, my, that, that's, that's warranted in, in my opinion. We, we uh, tend to look at the, the Rocky Mountains, the, the wetlands, the coast, uh, the lakes and forests and all these things. Uh, but we, we can disregard sometimes the, the Great Plains, even though uh, a lot of the numbers show that they're in need of as much help as anywhere else, if not more so. So just to give a couple, well, an introduction to a couple of these birds that uh, if you don't know, hopefully you can uh, get to know. Uh, my favorite starting off, the loggerhead shrike. Uh, this is a, uh, a bird that's also called the butcher bird. It's one of the, uh, if not the smallest uh, raptor, meaning it's a, it's a predatory bird. Uh, even eats other birds, mice, uh, and things like insects. And so this is something that generally attributed to loggerhead shrikes. Uh, they, although they're, they're a predator, they don't have the, the big strong talons and muscles like uh, a larger hawk or, or eagle do. And so they have to be smart about how they kill their prey. Uh, one of the things they do to do that is they'll catch it and then they'll impale it on, uh, classically it'd be a cactus thorn or a mesquite thorn or something like that. You know, here we see them on, on barbed wire a lot as well. And so they'll uh, use that barbed wire to hold that critter down and they'll uh, pick it apart. And they can do this, like I said, with uh, uh, small lizards, frogs, amphibians, uh, and even other, other birds, uh, things like sparrows. I've seen them uh, uh, capture them and, and do this to them as well. 
So it's a bird that we actually have both uh, uh, wintering and breeding populations in this area. Uh, right now, obviously, the birds you're probably seeing are, are the breeding birds. Um, uh, we see a little more uh, uh, more of these birds in the winter population that breed up north, but it's the breeding birds that live down here that are here in the summer uh, that are really showing the, the most consistent decline in this area. So to show that, uh, uh, another way is uh, this, this graph shows those same numbers I showed earlier, but it shows a change. Um, those blue dots are, are you know, from, from 30 years or so ago. The pink dots are the most recent. And what we see is, is a little scary. This is uh, uh, when a, a population of birds approaches uh, uh, extinction, uh, that, that decline curve starts to level off. And so this is starting to do that. And that's something that scares us. It starts to approach zero. And uh, uh, when we see a curve like that, it's something we need to really be, be thinking about. Another great bird, uh, uh, another one of my favorites, something that I used to, as a, a kid growing up uh, uh, in the woods up north, actually, not, not from down here originally, I look at my bird book and I always think of this bird as, as some, you know, crazy tropical beautiful bird that uh, I probably never get to see. Come down here uh, and uh, they're actually uh, pretty, pretty common down here, but beautiful bird, the painted bunting with that blue and red and yellow and green uh, 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 colors to it. The, the female, not quite so, so bright. She's that dark or that, that sort of olive green bird on the, the bottom right. Uh, but these birds breed in Texas uh, and in large numbers. And uh, uh, really most of, of the birds of painted bunnings that we see are either from Texas or Oklahoma or some populations in, in Louisiana as well. And there's some in, in deep South Florida. Um, so I'm not sure if this map is gonna work. No, it doesn't. So that map normally shows a uh, their migration throughout the year. But if you want to see me show that, you'll have to come see me do this talk in person sometime. Uh, Northern Bob White, next one, obviously an iconic bird, something that uh, there's been uh, working lands for wildlife uh, uh, attention to, NRCS attention to, sorry for using these acronyms, but a lot of government agencies are thinking about this bird and working on this bird, and a lot of landowners are consumed with this bird uh, as well. And uh, we know the Wildlife for Lunch webinars have I've talked about quail in the past too. Iconic game bird of South Texas. Uh, uh, but I like to show this because the needs of the, the northern bobwhite really capture the, the, the needs of, of grasslands and, and what we're losing by uh, not managing for uh, the same kind of native plant communities. And so this is kind of zoomed in on what I think is kind of the micro level of uh, perfect bobwhite habitat, but also can show the, uh, uh, the, the true condition of the prairie and tall grass prairie as well. And so this picture shows uh, that, that grass in the middle with that brown deadish grass at the base, that second year regrowth on little blue stem, the scenario that had been burned previous, previously. Uh, you see right next to that, uh, there's some bare ground there. And so this is a perfect uh, place for a, a, a northern bobwhite uh, mama to, to uh, scrape out and, and uh, cover up her nest. And so she'll uh, lay her eggs here and when those uh, chicks hatch, they're going to have bare ground to be able to run around and find seeds, find insects. Uh, those broadleaf plants, those flowers and forbs surrounding it are going to produce seeds. They're going to produce a variety of insects uh, for those uh, chicks to feed on as well. And so uh, we need to be thinking about the grass cover, the structure, but also uh, the importance of bare ground and where grass isn't. Uh, that's an important part of, of these uh, uh, this plant community and one of the characteristics, once again, of these native bunch grasses as opposed to, to turf grass. And so uh, northern bobwhite habitat needs are really the needs of, of the prairie writ large. So uh, uh, those declines that we've talked about have been mostly driven by the conversion of these grasslands. Now, like I said before, we've depend on this part of the United States to provide food, fiber, and fuel. Uh, it's important for that. And, and nobody's saying we need to change that. But as we learn more, we've learned we can, we can do both and avoid some of the kind of things that have happened in the past. And so uh, uh, over the course of the past 50 years, uh, less than 95% of those native grasslands still exist in their natural state. Almost all of this map I'm showing here uh, has some kind of impact or another, uh, even if it's still in, say, native rangeland, uh, or, or rangeland, I should say, uh, will have uh, exotic grasses or in some case overgrazing. On, in degraded plant communities. So we convert to croplands, pasturelands, rangelands. Rangeland conversions involve, uh, you know, we remove fire uh, that allows for woody encroachment to start to move into these areas. 
uh, replace periodic grazing with permanent grazing. So instead of uh, those buffalo herds moving through with the seasons, we have uh, permanent presence of, of cows fenced into an area. And then in a lot of cases, we've introduced non-native grass species uh, quite often on purpose, uh, thinking that they were going to produce uh, better forage for, for livestock. So the result has been the changing uh, condition on the landscape. We have a lot less of this, you know, up, upper left is tall grass prairie. Uh, this is a remnant in, I believe, Austin County. Uh, we see all too much of, of the situation in the top right, where we have overgrazed pasture, where the, the tallest things a, a cow pie. Now, obviously, there's a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, places that are, are in between those two. It doesn't have to be one or the other. Um, but uh, uh, in a lot of cases, we see it, quite a bit of that, that overgrazed rangeland. Uh, bottom left, that's kind of the natural condition of a, a post oak savanna or a savanna landscape. Uh, that's going to change the different trees and things. They're going to be different wherever you are in Texas. But for the most part, even where, uh, say, a place like the Hill Country, um, there's some debates about how much, you know, uh, woody cover there was there and how much brush. Uh, but almost anywhere you're talking about a savanna type ecosystem is a lot more open than we generally think of it. What's happened is, like I said before, we removed fire from that uh, that ecosystem and allowed things to uh, move in and, and kind of choke out a lot of those uh, uh, savannas. So we have that condition that you see there on the right with, uh, you know, whether it's yopon or, or one of the cedar species, um, really uh, uh, restricting that grass growth and those uh, flowering plants and the, the wildlife that depend on them. But it doesn't need to be that way. It's not not all bad. Uh, our guy, Aldo Leopold, uh, you know, the, the, the father of wildlife management, uh, put it well, he put it this way, that the land can be restored by the creative use of the same tools which have heretofore destroyed it. The axe, the plow, the cow, the fire, and the gun. And so uh, human uh, management can, can have both good and bad effects. It's just how we uh, uh, decide to uh, employ our different tools. So when he's talking about the axe, the axe has changed a little bit uh, to nowadays. You know, uh, this, this hydro axe, the, the cedar eater kind of thing, here it's on a skid steer, uh, but some cases on the front of a, a bulldozer or a tractor, um, uh, those can do great stuff uh, in the woods, really open up those places where they've become choked out. Uh, uh, if we've gone long enough without having fire in an area, sometimes we have to do something like this to uh, uh, sort of reclaim that area before we can even introduce fire back in. Uh, the the axe can also come in the form now of, of chemical, and so one of the uh, uh, best ways, and I'd encourage you if you're, you're interested in this, if you're a landowner, to get in touch with your local wildlife biologist, uh, NRCS professional, fish and wildlife professional, and they can uh, help you do some of this, give you some prescriptions, but um, a, rem a simple mix of remedy and diesel sprayed on the, the base of a, uh, a, a tree or, or brush uh, can, can generally kill that plant, especially things like Yopon and, and a lot of Savannah, Texas. Cows, I already talked a little bit about this. Um, cows, uh, herbivory, uh, infrey or, or uh, periodic herbivory was something that these grasslands evolved under. It's important, uh, it needs to be there. Uh, but when we have permanently stocked uh, places with, with just too many mouths, trying, we're trying to feed, uh, we, we degrade the quality and we degrade its ability to, to produce good forage and to uh, uh, have good weight gain. And so thinking about the kind of cows, uh, when you have them there, how many you have, how often you move them are all important things to think of. Uh, and uh, once again, a, a range professional can work with landowners on, on writing a good grazing plan that can avoid uh, you know, that situation on the left. Fire is something I've talked about, uh, mentioned a lot. Uh, it's something we can absolutely apply back to the land. Uh, this is one of our parks and wildlife biologists, Mark Lang in Colorado County, burning a, a, a tract. Uh, uh, it's a it's a fun thing to do as far as uh, uh, you know doing doing management work is concerned, um, but it's also one of the most uh, rewarding in that you can see just in the the following uh, growing season a great response from grass, from flowers, from all these different things. Uh, the the prairie really comes alive the year after a burn. And then the gun, uh, not necessarily a tool that is going to reclaim uh, prairies in and of themselves, uh, but getting out there and hunting, uh, buying those licenses, uh, uh, buying the, uh, the equipment that you need to, uh, to hunt and to, to, uh, for a lot of outdoor recreation, uh, a certain percentage of those dollars generated actually go to, uh, back to the states for 
uh, uh, habitat restoration. And so some of the, the our salaries for folks who work with Texas Parks and Wildlife are derived from from those sales. And so getting out there and and uh, and hunting helps fund uh, the 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 work that folks are doing around throughout the state. And then I saved the plow to last. Um, a lot of this land, we've lost the prairie because it's been plowed under, uh, but we've just started recently to, to turn those plows around and, and plant these places back to prairie. Uh, a couple different means of doing this, bottom right, that's a, uh, a no-till seed drill, uh, which I'll, I'll mention a little bit later, but uh, that top right is uh, uh, what we call a bale buster. Those are uh, uh, harvested native prairie grass uh, uh, hay bales that are put through this this bale buster that basically chews them up and spits them out. And uh, they've all, that, that grass or that hay was collected after those grasses went to seed. And so it, it puts that seed back out on the uh, on a prepared seed bed. Pretty neat treatment and can have great effects. But uh, to talk a little more about uh, uh, native grass restoration and, and how we turn that plow around and, and use it to restore these prairies, I, I tend to try to talk a little bit of some of the questions, some of the things we do most uh, in, in my line of work is work with landowners on restoring native grass on their property on, in a particular pasture. And so uh, just a quick overview of, of how we do that. Uh, the first thing you'll hear whenever you ask a biologist uh, a simple yes or no question is it depends. And, and we know that we apologize for that, but it really does. These answers are usually pretty complex. Uh, but I've tried to boil this down to uh, some of the uh, most simple steps. But first things first, uh, uh, it's important to get out there and identify what you currently have. Uh, it's, it, it doesn't happen frequently because there's not a lot of those places, but it has happened to me on a number of occasions where uh, or somebody will get an interest in restoring native grass on their property. They'll hear a talk like this. They'll read something and they'll say, I want to I want to do this in my place. Come out and have a look. We get out there and it's actually a, a, a native pasture. There's some uh, healthy native plant community out there. In those cases, uh, the, the the restoration work or the management work might be, uh, uh, you know, as simple as, uh, you know, rotating some cows through or maybe doing a prescribed burn. Um, we might not have to go all the way back to, to restoring native grass there. Uh, this is sort of a, 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 a last-ditch effort to reclaim a lot of these areas. Uh, we're talking about doing a full native grass restoration. So the important part is to get out there and figure out what you currently have. Uh, this is a kind of a, I, I put this particular picture because this is kind of a difficult one. It, we can, all of us are better at identifying grass later in the year when it's produced seed. This is the, the spring after a winter burn. And you can see that most of this grass is just coming up. That's pretty tricky to do. Um, but uh, if you get the right biologist, they can tell you what kind of grass is out there even then. Controlling exotics is uh, the most important step and usually where we spend 90% of uh, the work that's that's getting done. Um, so this is a picture right here of a, a pasture we we have planted since, but uh, we had spent uh, uh, almost two whole growing seasons controlling the grass that's out there. And if you look at it closely, it looks kind of like you got this 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 green cover there, but that's almost all forbs and annual plants. And so we had mostly killed the what was Bermuda and Bahia grass in this particular place. Uh, uh, the, the way you do that, the best ways to control are generally chemical. Talk about Roundup, glyphosate, um, multiple applications throughout a go growing season. Sometimes it can take two to three times. I've also seen folks uh, do this for multiple growing seasons, so a couple couple years in a row. Uh, when you're talking about Bermuda grass, Bahia grass, some of those turf grasses, uh, disking doesn't necessarily work that well as a control. Uh, but in some places, there's evidence. Uh, on South Texas in particular, if you're trying to control KR, uh, that repeated disking, just like you would do repeated herbicide applications, uh, can be a, a means to, to get a good kill on those grasses. But for the most part, we're generally talking about spraying these with, with Roundup. You need to pick the right seed mix when it is time to go back and plant. Uh, I would absolutely consult a, a resource professional about this. Uh, you can talk to a seed company. They usually have pretty good recommendations. Um, but they're generally trying to sell you a product too, which isn't a bad thing, but uh, it, it's good to have somebody sometimes on your side that is just uh, uh, thinking what's uh, what's going to be the most effective for your place. So talk to a resource professional, and they can even clue you in on the uh, the seed companies that are going to have the right kind of seed for your, your property. Uh, one of the things that they'll probably go to first is the web soil survey, and this is something that anybody can Google. It's a, uh, a service that uh, the uh, 
USDA and NRCS offer. Uh, basically, you can draw a boundary around your property and see what soil type you have, what soil types in most cases. Uh, and that soil data also shows the native plant community. And so you're going to be able to look through there and see what kind of grass species and even percentages of, of what kind of grass species generally occur. Now, what that's really describing is usually kind of the, the climax grass community. Uh, and grass, like anything else, goes through stages when it gets established. And so uh, we generally tend to add some more uh, what we call early successional or kind of these colonizing grant, uh, grass uh, seeds in a mix as well. So a, a good seed mix probably won't look exactly like what your web soil survey describes as the plant community, uh, but it would be pretty similar and it'll have a lot of the same components. Most the, I, I tend to think the, the no-till seed drill is uh, uh, the best way to plant. Now it's not the only way and there's, there's folks that could, would disagree. Uh, broadcasting can work really well too. Um, when you broadcast seed, though, uh, you're probably going to need to uh, do a, a little more advanced work uh, to prep the seed bed. In a case like this, this is the no-till seed drill uh, uh, at work. And they're able to plant through uh, a little bit of vegetation there that was left after uh, spraying. When you're broadcasting, you're probably not going to be able to do that. You're probably going to want it to be smooth, bare dirt. Uh, and then you're probably going to want to come back and in uh, uh, roll that, the, the, these fluffy grass seeds are gonna have the best chance of germinating when they're in firm contact with a firm seed bed. Um, this native seed drill is designed to, this seed drill is designed to do that. Uh, when you broadcast, you might not get that sort of uh, firm contact. And so we uh, generally recommend folks come back in and maybe roll it with a cultipacker or something along those lines. Uh, you generally, if you're gonna broadcast seed too, you're probably gonna wanna uh, uh, increase the seed mix. Even sometimes some folks recommend uh, doubling the amount of seed you're putting out there, which can of course uh, increase the cost. Uh, this native grass seed drill here is a little different than most of the seed drills. One of those, if, if you know anything about drills on the back there, it's got a, a couple different hoppers. Uh, one of those hoppers is specifically designed to handle this light fluffy seed that, that is native seed. Uh, it's got this agitator in it to make sure that the, it doesn't get clogged and that it all uh, feeds through uh, correctly. And so uh, you want to make sure you've got the right kind of equipment. This is a true X. There's a lot of others. Um, uh, there's organizations throughout the state that can provide these for your use. Uh, some feed stores have them as well. What I would do is once again, if you're thinking about a project like this, get in touch with a, a resource professional in your area and they're probably going to be able to key you into who has one of these available or where you could uh, uh, rent one. So uh, after we've, you know, hopefully, uh, you know, work with, with uh, a landowner to, to get them uh, up to speed and, and thinking about what we want them to, to do and what can benefit wildlife best out there. It's important for us to be able to uh, provide support for that work too. And so one of the ways we've done that is develop our grass and restoration incentive program. It's not the only way, but it's one of the ways. It's somewhat regionally specific, but I'll mention another program that's a little more uh, widespread as well. So our, our grass and restoration incentive program can provide funding for uh, any one of those practices that I mentioned already, whether it's native grass reseeding, uh, brush management, uh, both in the form of chemical or mechanical, uh, prescribed burning, prescribed grazing. Uh, this is a program that's funded by uh, state and private dollars largely. Uh, started with a, a grant from ConocoPhillips. Um, uh, it's since had uh, various other uh, uh, funding sources, including upland game bird stamp funds. So once again, when you buy a hunting license, you buy your super combo license, you buy your upland game bird stamp, those dollars have gone into this uh, uh, in years past. Uh, we also work with the Texas Parks and Wildlife Foundation. I'd encourage anybody uh, that's feeling uh, philanthropic to, to look at the Parks and Wildlife Foundation. Uh, they, they do some great work uh, throughout the state and they're, they're the nonprofit partner of Texas Parks and Wildlife and, and uh, uh, have accomplished some good stuff. So this Grass and Restoration Incentive Program, I'm showing this map on the left, that's one of the areas that's available. And if you, to orient you, this is uh, in the middle there, that's Lavaca County, uh, the Hallettsville area. This goes up to Brenham in kind of the north, and then down to Carnes and Wilson County in the southeast. So kind of just outside that picture are, are Houston to the east and San Antonio to the, to the west. So for this program in this particular area, uh, project area must be at least 50 acres or a treatment area, at least 25 acres. Project area is the entire area we're managing for grass and wildlife. Treatment area is just the area we're treating. And so um, uh, if you have a whole property, but, it's, but you don't have a treatment that's 25 acres, if you have a whole property that's over 50 acres where you're uh, managing for grassland habitat, uh, we can qualify you in the program. 
pay the estimated 75% of the cost. So that's a fixed payment rate that, that we pay. It's not a true cost share, but basically we have estimates of how much this work is going to cost. And we're going to give you, regardless of how much you spend, 75% uh, of that estimate. Sometimes that ends up being a little low. Sometimes it ends up being a high. For the most part, it, it equals out. Uh, you're reimbursed after the treatment's completed. So landowners do have to come out of pocket to, to pay for the work to get, get done. But uh, we try to reimburse pretty promptly within uh, a few weeks. And uh, uh, you're required to maintain the habitat for five years after that, that treatment's done. I want to mention, uh, uh, because that, that GRIT program, sorry, the Grassland Restoration Incentive Program, or GRIT program as we call it, is somewhat regionally specific. Uh, I showed that, that one map um, uh, showing the southeast Texas area, we call it. Uh, there's also a number of counties uh, up in the uh, uh, kind of cross timbers, rolling plains area, just east of Wichita Falls, just kind of west of Fort Worth. Uh, those dark area, those dark counties up there, Clay, Archer, Baylor, Throckmorton, Shackford, Stevens, and Callahan, and then Ellis and Navarro counties. Uh, all of those are eligible for the GRIP program. Uh, but those lighter green counties, including the GRIP counties, are also, avail are also uh, eligible for uh, natural resource conservation, bobway uh, quail, uh, uh, statewide resource concerns. So uh, NRCS through their EQIP program, their Environmental Quality Incentive Program, have put aside uh, $5 million uh, available for the next five years um, uh, to fund projects uh, like the ones I've been talking about in any of these counties that are shaded here. So if you find yourself in one of these counties, uh, you need to uh, get in touch with your NRCS agent, or your district conservationist, you're probably going to have to go to the uh, FSA office, the Farm Service Agency office, and, uh, and qualify and be, uh, uh, get qualified and, and be eligible, make sure you're eligible for projects. Uh, but most land that has the potential to be in production is. Uh, and so uh, uh, work with those folks to, to get a conservation plan written and to get a project developed, and, and there's, there should be funding available uh, for that. Uh, most types of grass and restoration practices qualify under that resource concern. Uh, there's always existing uh, equipped hours, not always, but generally existing equipped hours under regular equip as well. And so I uh, encourage you to, if you're at all interested in this stuff, get with your uh, NRCS district conservationist and, and talk about uh, uh, your property. They'll, they'll come out and take a look uh, at, uh, at no charge and, and uh, talk to you about your place. So that's all I've got. Uh, if, uh, if there's any questions, uh, hopefully I can answer them and I've left enough time here. Clint. Thanks very much, John. Uh, I want to thank all of y'all who attended first uh, for for coming and joining us on such short notice with the change in presentation. If you came for the disease presentation, I'm glad you stuck with us. Uh, John, I want to thank you for the extremely short notice. Uh, John got a phone call at about 10.15 today and I asked him if he would give this presentation. So uh, very short notice, we made it work and it was some awesome information. We still do have time if anybody has questions. Uh, looks like we just had one come in. Bear with me and let me get to it. So I'm working with my local NRCS office in Callahan County. We're going, we're doing a 58 acre project of grubbing and introduction of natural grasses and forbs. Um, there are quail on the property now, maybe two coveys. What kind of population increase can I expect afterwards? Ooh, uh, that's a that's a great question. Um, one of the challenges with quail in particular is not just what's on your place or in between your fence line, but what's around your place. Um, and so, depending on you know the type of landscape it's in and what your neighbors are doing, um, you know, 58 acres is uh, uh, it's a good sized project, and that's that's great to hear. You you sound like you're doing great work there. Um, uh, uh, but to get you know that much more over you know two coveys is actually probably pretty good. Uh, you know, if you average covey size a dozen birds, you're talking 24 birds uh, on average on 58 acres, you know, that's a, a bird to two acres. Uh, you know, great places, uh, especially in a year like this where we've seen some good production, uh, maybe a, a bird to acre is a really good uh, population. And so, um, you know, in a great year, you could, you could maybe double what you're seeing now. But uh, in all honesty, what really matters is what the folks around you are doing too. So, uh, you know, encourage you to, to talk to your neighbors. Okay. Do you have any recommendations on books or resources on the history of Texas prairies? Ooh. Uh, 
I'm, I'm, I, I do. I, I could give you a list. I don't know if I can name off the top of my head. Uh, there's a great book that's a little more, um, that's somewhat poetic, uh, talking about prairies, called Prairie Time. It's pretty neat. Um, there's, uh, when it comes to managing, you know, specific for bob whites, there's Beef Brush and Bob Whites. The, the Guthrie book uh, is, is one of the best. Um, there's, uh, man, that's a, that's tough to do off the top of my head, but um, if you want to send me an email, I could try to send some, some references. Okay. Do you uh, have any ideas on who will do or help with prescribed burns in the Palo Pinto and Eastland County areas? Ooh, uh, I would, uh, uh, it, prescribed burns for government agencies can be challenging and uh, different agencies handle them in different ways. Um, uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is moving away from actually doing the prescribed burn, although they help you fund it. Um, NRCS uh, maybe might be moving away from it a little too, although they still probably have the ability to do it if you work with them. Uh, I would say in that area, uh, your parks and wildlife biologist is probably a good person to talk to. Um, I know there's some, in, in those counties in particular, there's some expertise um, uh, that, can, that can probably help you. Uh, in a lot of parts of Texas, there's what's called prescribed burn associations, with their, which are groups of, of landowners that have come together to share equipment and expertise. I'm not sure Palo Pinto and Eastland County if there is one up there or, or what it would be. Um, but if you go to, if you Google search for the Prescribed Burn Alliance of Texas, uh, that's an organization, uh, kind of an umbrella organization of, of all those prescribed burn associations. Uh, you might be able to, to get a contact there. But I would definitely talk to your parks and wildlife biologist about doing a burn. You have piqued somebody's curiosity, and we have a question about your last picture that's showing here. <laughs> yeah, this is usually a presentation I give in person. Um, that's the weasel pecker. So that's uh, uh, that's an actual picture taken, at, I believe, in in, in England. Uh, this this woodpecker-like bird was foraging on the ground, and uh, the weasel thought it was going to be lunch and jumped on the back of it to eat it, and there's a whole sequence of these. So it's actually a real picture. It's a whole sequence of these where you see this this bird get startled and fly off with this weasel on its back. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> um, what, uh, what specifically can the Wildlife Habitat Federation do to help a landowner to restore native grasses on their land? Uh, so the Wildlife Habitat Federation is a, a great organization that kind of takes that next step beyond, say, what a parks and wildlife biologist can do. Uh, so a lot of these resource professionals, we can write you a plan, we can tell you what you need to do, uh, but you know we're we don't we're not able to drive the tractor or get out there and, and do the work. Uh, wildlife Habitat Federation can uh, can kind of do it all from soup to nuts, and so uh, they they give Jim Willis, who's the the founder and, and president. Uh, has has a great head for this stuff, and he can give great recommendations. But they've also got staff and equipment now. You know that seed drill, some specific equipment uh, that that they can uh, uh, take out to your place and actually you know use and, and work. So um, uh, you know they they charge a fee for that service, uh, but they're a nonprofit, and so nobody's you know getting getting rich off that. Uh, but uh, uh, they have a lot of that ability to kind of do a little more turnkey habitat work, uh, and so. It's, it's somewhat specific to uh, maybe the kind of the southeast uh, Texas area, but uh, uh, they can, you know, if you just want to call and pick their brain if you live elsewhere in Texas, um, you can do that as, as well. But uh, great organization. Okay. Uh, looks like that's all we have for now. I want to post a couple things up for you all. Uh, the first is the link that's up in the chat window now. I'm sorry, I posted that in the question and answer window. Uh, the link that's in the chat window now, you can go back and watch this webinar and all of our other recorded webinars. Uh, give us about a week or so to get that, to get this up on the on the webpage, but it should be there uh, and you will be able to go back and, and find those. Uh, also, I'd like to mention that our next webinar is going to be on October 20th, uh, once again, the third Thursday of the month. It's going to be presented by Robert Perez with Tex Parks and Wildlife Department, and it's going to be Coffee Shop Quail Talk. It's going to talk about common myths and misconceptions about quail, uh, so tying in nicely with this presentation. I think that's all the questions we have. Once again, John, I really appreciate it. Everybody who tuned in, thank you all very much. Um, if you have any more questions, feel free to reach out to me, and I can get you in touch with John. Thanks, guys. Absolutely. Talk to you soon.